The following program is a project of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society, Incorporated, and funded in part by grants from the Michigan Council for the Arts and Michigan Council for the Humanities. Lake Superior, the biggest of the five Great Lakes, one of the deepest and coldest of any lake in the world. Superior's southern shore, among the most violent with its prevailing northwest winds. Whitefish Point, every ship coming in and out of Superior has to pass here. It's earned its reputation as the graveyard of the Great Lakes. With no place to hide, this 80-mile stretch from Munising, Michigan to Whitefish Point has often been a sailor's nightmare. The skeletons of ships who lost in their battle against Superior's fury dot the shore along the way. All that's left of those sailing into the Whitefish Point area, but not sailing out. Sailors have risked their lives navigating Superior since its first discovery in 1610 by early French explorers. But access to Lake Superior was restricted because of a long stretch of powerful rapids at Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, separating this mighty lake from the other four Great Lakes. French and British fur traders soon discovered there were fortunes to be made here, but only if they could get the furs to the lucrative eastern markets hundreds of miles away. Intense rivalry between the French and British to control the market forced both to abandon their slow 33-foot canoes and look for better ways to move their goods. Larger sailing craft was the only answer. The 60-foot schooner Invincible was among the first to be built on Lake Superior. But she couldn't live up to her name. The lake would soon prove she was not invincible. It was the first commercial vessel lost to Superior's fury driven ashore in 1816 by a raging November storm and torn apart as she hit the shallows off Whitefish Point. As years passed and other ships met the same fate, a growing need for a guiding beacon at Whitefish Point became evident. This particular light could mark the critical turning point for all up and down bound traffic entering and leaving Lake Superior. Finally, in 1847, the U.S. Congress ordered a lighthouse to be built there. In the spring of 1849, James Van Rensler, the first lighthouse keeper at Whitefish Point, climbed the 60-foot stone tower and lit the whale oil lamp to finally show the way for the hundreds of sailors who had for years dreaded sailing past this treacherous point. The beacon continues to guide the way even today as the most important light on the lake. The discovery of copper in the isolated western Lake Superior region prompted investors to look for ways to move huge amounts of this valuable ore to the lower industrial ports of the Great Lakes for processing. Sailing vessels couldn't do it, but steam-powered, propeller-driven ships could. J.M. Averill, a Chicago industrialist, had the vision to, for the first time, lift a propeller-driven steamer out of the water and portage it around the rapids at Sault Ste. Marie. It took seven weeks to move the Independence one mile to Lake Superior, where she would become the first steamship to sail the mighty lake. She carried copper and other cargoes for eight years until her life suddenly and violently ended, November 21st, 1853. She was upbound and fully loaded with winter supplies for Western Lake Superior settlements when her boiler exploded, tearing her to bits. It killed four of her crew 
as she became the first steamer sunk on Lake Superior. Two years later, shipping took off with the construction of the first lock at Sault Ste. Marie, allowing vessels to freely enter and leave Lake Superior, just as the growing iron ore industry needed a quick economical way to take the raw ore south to the nation's industrial heartland. President Lincoln could see the country was headed for a civil war and knew, because of the dependence on shipping, whichever side controlled the lighthouses and navigation would have an advantage. While the civil war was beginning in 1861, work was being completed on replacement of the Whitefish Point Light Tower, the same tower still standing today. Through the years, control of the lighthouse passed through the hands of a number of government agencies. But the strict regulations imposed on the keepers and their families remained rigidly enforced. Robert Carlson was the keeper of the light at the turn of the century. His family, including his granddaughter Bertha, saw their share of Lake Superior's life-threatening temper. Bertha vividly remembers the night the Myron went down. She was 15 years old. I could hear the wind moaning and so forth around. So I got up and I went to the window. And oh, it looked horrible out. And I raised the window. Everybody was praying. The only thing we could think of was dying men. And that's a cold, cold grave. The Myron would become one of the most famous shipwrecks on Lake Superior. November 22nd of 1919. She was running out of Munising, towing the schooner tow barge Miztech. Both were fully loaded with lumber and trying to make one last trip east to Sault Ste. Marie before winter set in. But Mother Nature had other ideas. The Myron ran right into the teeth of a fierce November gale just short of Whitefish Point. The waves crashing completely over the 186-foot ship, freezing as soon as they hit the deck. The weight of the ice making her unstable in the heavy seas. Captain Walter Neal decided the Miztech had to be cut loose. Both vessels would stand a better chance on their own. His decision saved the Miztech and its crew. But the pounding of the waves on the hull of the Myron began taking its toll. She was starting to break apart, taking on water faster than her steam-powered pumps could handle. When the water reached the boiler, it drowned the fire. Without power, Captain Neal knew the ship would not make it and he ordered his 18 crewmen to abandon ship. The Myron wasn't alone on the lake that day. The steel steamer Adriatic had been closing on the Myron all day and was by then close enough to see the small wooden ship was in trouble. Alfred Thiebaud was 15 years old at the time and one of the Adriatic's cooks. The fellows on the, the Myron, they were, uh, they were, uh, we knew that they were, they didn't have a chance. We knew it right from the start, you know. There was no way, there was no way we could ever even rescue them that I could ever see or nobody else could see because it was so, you know, the, the conditions of the weather and everything, a blinding snowstorm and the huge waves and stuff like that. And, and that lumber, you know, the lumber had washed off her deck and they, they lowered a couple of lifeboats, but they got into that, in amongst that lumber and stuff like that. And then they disappeared about, you're around dark, we couldn't see them no more. So we didn't know whether they, they got hit by lumber and pierced a hole through there and sank there or what. Could Nobody. you hear any of the people from the Myron? Did you have any oh, voice yeah, they, contact they with them? Oh yeah, they hollered. Just, just we could hear them faint voice that hollering for help and stuff like that, but that's it. And they were getting, you know, numb and stuff like that from the cold and in the water. You, do, you can't do it, you're helpless, you can't do a thing. You know, you just, uh, you're there and you're, you're just poor fellows. You know they're going to die. When it was all over, all of the ship's crew were dead. Everyone except the captain. Ironically, he chose to go down with his ship, but was the only survivor. He was in the pilot house when a wave tore it from the deck. He was picked up by a passing steamer 20 hours later, holding on to the pilot house roof and nearly frozen to death. 
He didn't waste any time accusing the captains of the boats who tried to save his crew of not doing enough. They tried to take our captain's license away because they thought he could have did more, but there was no way he could have ever done more. There was no way I could ever see him. He, could, he did everything he could do, and plus he was endangering the, his own ship and our, uh, all of us, you know, because we had hit bottom twice. The next day, one of the Myron's lifeboats washed ashore carrying the bodies of eight frozen crewmen. 15-year-old Beulah Johnston's brother didn't want her to see what the lake had done. He told her to not go down to the dock. But we did anyway, this girlfriend of mine. And the bodies were caked in ice, and they were sitting up against the, the pilot house, the back of the pilot house. And right today, when I close my eyes, I can see that sight. One fellow's mustache was up here, and it was really something to see those bodies and caked in, you know, in that ice. The tow barge Mizdek, damaged during the sinking of the Myron, survived and was towed to the Sioux. But a year and a half later, she foundered and sank three miles from the final resting place of the Myron. All hands were lost. And in one final twist, Captain Neal, the only survivor of the Myron, was the first mate on the vessel towing the Mizdek. Lake Superior's fury wasn't responsible for every shipping disaster along the shipwreck coast. July 27, 1884, the wooden steamer John M. Osborne became a victim of collision in heavy fog. It was almost dark, and she was downbound near Whitefish Point, a treacherous stretch because of the congested shipping traffic. The fog only made it worse. Captain Tom Wilford, worried about possible collision, ordered the speed checked down and the whistle blown once every minute. Not far away, the huge steel-hulled passenger liner Alberta was upbound and headed straight for the Osborne. The fog kept the two from knowing how close they were until it was too late. The Osborne became the fourth victim within a month of the Alberta's excessive speed. The steel-hulled Alberta easily sliced through the wood hull of the Osborne. The impact was so severe, the broken timbers wedged the two ships together. But it gave the crew of the Osborne a way out, up her broken mast and rigging lying across the deck of her assailant. With the Osborne steam lines exploding, her crew scrambled to climb to the safety of the Alberta's deck. One Alberta passenger jumped to the Osborne to help. He found Captain Wilford's daughters in their aft cabin and carried them to safety. He went back to the sinking ship to help two of the Osborne's deckhands rescue a scalded crewman trapped in the engine room. Their heroic efforts cost them their lives. Suddenly, the Osborne shuddered and broke free from the Alberta. The weight of the iron ore cargo put her in a 170-foot dive to the bottom. She sat there alone for the next 100 years until a team of research divers found the wreckage in 1984.
8 a.m. The Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society dive team is beginning what will be one of their most dangerous and emotional dives ever. Four and a half miles offshore, the Superior City lies in 265 feet of water, the gravesite for 29 of her crew. What do you expect out of visibility on the Superior City today? Uh, 30, 40 feet, I would say. Anyway, it should be pretty good. On the trip out, the divers carefully prepare themselves and their equipment for the job of safely photographing the tragedy, lying in the cold, dark silence below. The 429-foot Superior City crashed into the bottom below August 20th, 1920. It was early evening and she was downbound in the crowded shipping lanes off Whitefish Point. Clear skies and calm water helped the ships ease past one another, their whistles signaling their intentions. But suddenly there was confusion between the signals of the Superior City and the larger, more powerful Willis King. The captain of the Superior City quickly realized there was no way to avoid a collision. He sounded the alarm to abandon ship. His crew mustered on the afterdeck, preparing to launch the lifeboats when they heard the deadly sound of steel ripping through steel. Within seconds, the cold water was rushing toward the Superior City's hot boilers. Their contact sparked a violent explosion, killing everyone except the four still on the bow of the ship. The vortex of the sinking pulled the victims with her as she impaled herself into the bottom. Divers find the remains of two sailors in the twisted wreckage near the lifeboat station. Time has claimed the human form, but one sailor's shoe and his leg bone remain together, now becoming part of the rusting hull as they take on the color of their surroundings. The propeller is at a depth of 240 feet, but the bottom is still 25 feet below. The ship sits at a 45 degree angle to the bottom, with her bow embedded into the mud up to her pilot house. Vivid evidence of the force of her sinking. A wedding ring found among the finger bones of one of the victim's skeletons is one of the unsolved mysteries of the Superior City sinking. It's engraved with the name Edwin and his wedding date but the only Edwin on the crew list was 18 years old at the time of the sinking, and the engraved date would have made him 10 years old on his wedding day. The dive team has spent 15 minutes on the wreck. Now they have to pay the price for a dive this deep. Over an hour hanging on the decompression line to avoid getting the bends. Photographing wrecks in dives like this is only part of what the historical society does. Diving on shipwrecks is very exciting, of course, and the, and the history that lies below the waters off Whitefish Point is fascinating. But there aren't very many people that can join us on the bottom. But to share the excitement we felt the museum was critical. The history could be interpreted, and we've done that. And the artifacts, if they were left on the shipwreck, are disturbed sometimes by nature and by man. It's very important.
bring some of these endangered specimens up, properly care for them, and exhibit them in a way that everybody can enjoy the history and the excitement that we've found on the bottom. Because of this museum, many of the artifacts taken by divers from shipwrecks around Whitefish Point are now being returned for preservation and display in the gallery. The museum is designed to bring to life the history and tragedy of the shipwrecks in an entertaining way. Divers exploring the actual ribs of an 1850s shipwreck. The hand-carved eagle from the pilot house of the shipwreck Vienna and a 17-foot-tall lighthouse lens from the White Shoal Light Station are part of what makes this the most unique shipwreck museum in the world. The state of Michigan has considerable concern over the historical significance and preservation of all shipwrecks and artifacts found on its bottomlands. The Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society is dedicated to working closely with the state to carry out that mission. Sailors have learned much from early shipping disasters on the Great Lakes. Equipment has been designed to aid in navigation and communication, but there is still nothing to save a ship from the fury of Mother Nature. November 10, 1975, the 729-foot ore carrier Edmund Fitzgerald, fighting 90 mile-an-hour winds 17 miles northwest of Lake Superior's Whitefish Point, disappeared in 35-foot seas. Six months later, the U.S. Navy found the wreckage in 530 feet of water and started its search for a probable cause for the sinking. What was hailed as the most comprehensive investigation into a Great Lakes maritime disaster ever conducted only posed more questions than it sought to answer. The findings were disputed, and theories proposed by others are many. But a definite cause for the Fitzgerald's demise is known only by the souls of the 29 crewmen still at their stations in this graveyard of the Great Lakes. The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down at the big lake they call Gitchagumi. The lake, it is said, never gives up her dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. With the load of iron ore, 26,000 tons more than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty. That good ship and true was a bone to be chewed when the gales of November came early. The ship was the pride of the American side, coming back from some mill in Wisconsin. As the big freighters go, it was bigger than most With a crew and good captain well seasoned Concluding some terms with a couple of steel firms When they left fully loaded for Cleveland Then later that night when the ship's bell rang Could it be the north wind they'd been feeling? Tattletale sound and the wave broke over the railing. And every man knew as the captain did too, twas the witch of November come stealing. The dawn came late and the breakfast had to wait when the gales of November came slashing. When afternoon came, it was freezing rain. In the face of a hurricane west wind 